I'm Kiralee Pels. I'm a lecturer in childhood at UCL Institute of Education and a research associate with the Young Lives Study. Today I'm going to present four key findings from children's experiences of violence, evidence from Ethiopia, India, Peru and Vietnam. Young Lives has been collaborating with UNICEF Office of Research on the multi-country study on the drivers of violence affecting children. This study is in four countries, Peru and Vietnam, which are the same as Young Lives, and then also in Zimbabwe and Italy. Our contribution has been drawing on the longitudinal survey and qualitative data from Young Lives, bringing in also data from Ethiopia and India to inform the first stage of the study, which has been doing some secondary data analysis. What I'm going to present on is four of the themes that have emerged from our survey and qualitative analysis. So the first theme, children experience multiple forms of violence across different settings. Research has often focused on specific types of violence or violence occurring in specific places or settings. However, what emerges from the Young Lives accounts are the interconnections between children's experiences of different types of violence, such as corporal punishment and bullying between peers, and also between experiences of violence in different settings, such as the home and school. Violence is a part of everyday life for many children at home, school, in the community and while working. Violence was more likely to be reported within the home than being inflicted by strangers. For example, at age 15, over a third of girls and a quarter of boys in Peru reported being physically hurt by a family member. Corporal punishment is widely used by teachers in schools in all four of the study countries, despite legal prohibition. The figure shows among children age 8, over half in Peru and Vietnam, three quarters in Ethiopia and over 9 and 10 in India reported witnessing a teacher administering corporal punishment in the last week. In all four countries, many children describe being hit by parents and teachers as well as experiencing fighting or bullying between peers. Within schools, bullying is often part of a wider violent environment where harsh disciplinary practices such as corporal punishment serve to normalise violence. Violence is the foremost reason children give for disliking school. Second, children's experiences of and responses to violence are shaped by age and gender. Boys tend to report more physical forms of violence, whereas girls report emotional violence and gender-based violence, including sexual harassment. At younger ages, children report higher rates of corporal punishment as they become older, other forms of violence become more common in their accounts, including domestic violence between parents, concerns over safety in public places, and bullying between peers. Children experience both violence at school and violence in the home, and these experiences are interconnected. When experiencing domestic violence, children are not only the victims of this violence, they also seek strategies to combat it and protect other family members. This is illustrated by the example of Naga. Naga is a 15-year-old girl from Vietnam. She didn't pass the entrance exam to continue on to the next stage of schooling, so she decided to stay at home and help out her parents. She also talked about the domestic violence that was taking place as her father was beating her mother. She tried to help her mother out in two ways. Firstly, when her father went out drinking, she was the one who stayed up late to let him back in the house in order to protect her mother. She also went to work at a cafe and gave the earnings to her mother. She explained that although she had left school, she had a few good friends who supported her because they were in a similar situation to herself. So case studies such as these illustrate how children's experiences of violence are often cumulative with impact on their lives over time, shaping not only their well-being but also their trajectories through schooling and into adulthood. Third, violence reflects and reinforces discriminatory social and gender norms. So violence affecting children takes place in the context of other norms, particularly in relation to gender and ethnicity. 
Girls' and boys' differential experiences and responses to violence are linked with notions of masculinity and femininity, especially in relation to physical punishment. This varies cross-culturally, but in India, for example, norms relating to femininity mean that girls are required to be docile and submissive, but they must not be naughty, for example, while constructions of masculinity mean that boys are supposed to accept physical punishment and withstand pain. Similarly, in Peru, violence from teachers was replicated by children in forms of violent bullying, with the use of violence justified as teaching a lesson and enforcing conformity with harmful gender norms. As a head teacher in Peru said, boys have to be treated more roughly, while girls are more delicate and quiet. They cannot be disciplined in the same way. Domestic violence and gender-based norms was reported then as a way in which existing patriarchal norms are normalised and maintained. This often becomes particularly acute for girls once past puberty. In both India and Ethiopia, girls reported experiencing harassment from boys on the way to school. One girl from Ethiopia explained, We cannot study because we always worry about the boy's threat. We are frightened always. She later described her relief at having moved closer to her school. Children from ethnic minorities or other marginalised social groups report experiencing violence in schools because of their status. This includes being bullied by teachers and being, by, being bullied by other children. This impacts on children's ability to learn, their engagement with schooling, and ultimately leads to some children deciding to leave school. So from this we can see how violence consistently undermines access to schools, for girls who feel unsafe to go to school or are unable to study there, and from children from marginalised groups who feel victimised on account of their ethnicity. Violence therefore becomes a channel replicating existing discriminatory norms. And fourth, poverty causes stress, increasing the likelihood of violence. Children's accounts of violence were set against the backdrop of a lack of resources, from overcrowded classrooms to lack of social protection measures that mean children's work is needed for family survival, lack of family resources to pay for school fees, exercise books, uniforms and so on. So poverty puts a great strain on relationships in families, schools and communities. For example, financial hardship can lead to stress on families resulting in alcoholism or domestic violence, as we saw earlier. Children need to work and this may expose them to violence from employers, or that they may struggle with the challenges of balancing work and school. Often children miss school to go to work, but then are physically punished when they return to school. For example, Ranadi, page 13, explains how he was beaten when he returned to school after the harvest. He said, they hit us because I didn't go to school for one month and I missed the lessons. Lack of materials for school also means that children are punished. As another boy from India said, if we don't get notebooks, then the teachers will beat us. A mother of a seven-year-old girl in India said that the only thing her daughter didn't like about school was that her teacher beat her. She said she studies well, but when there is no uniform and when we delay the fee payments, then she will not go. She refuses to go and she hides behind that wall and says, sir will beat me, they will beat me. So poorer students and children from other disadvantaged groups tend to be disproportionately affected by corporal punishment in school and by bullying. Children describe verbal bullying that made direct reference to their impoverished circumstances, whether through name-calling or insults such as child of a destitute, or making fun of the poor quality of their clothing or lack of, school, lack of shoes. Children reported being absent from school or even stopping going to school completely rather than being stigmatised and bullied. So to conclude, from the Young Lives evidence, we see how violence in the lives of many children is pervasive, is often routinized and normalized. Children's accounts reveal the multiple factors that shape their experiences of responses to violence, and also the interconnections between the different types of violence and the multiple settings in which violence occurs. 
Children's experiences and responses change with age and are shaped by social inequalities related to gender and the discrimination and disadvantage experienced by other marginalised groups. The distress and experience of dealing with violence can impact negatively upon children, particularly in terms of their emotional well-being and also in relation to schooling. This is not necessarily to say that children are passive victims, rather that children actively make meaning of their experiences and develop strategies for responding to violence. However, these are constrained by the economic, social and cultural context in which children are living. Thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to learn more about our findings, the full paper is available on the Young Lives website, www.younglives.org.uk. There's a paper that pulls together findings from across the four countries. There's also standalone individual papers on each of the four countries and further papers on the topics of corporal punishment and bullying.